Chapter 14 The Lion's Share They left the woods as quickly as possible and took the metalled road. It was noontide, and they walked along in the sunshine, Noble in the middle, Eastgrim on one side, Renard on the other, all three abreast, visible from all sides. Of all the paths which wound between the hedges and the enclosures, only the road went straight across the plain. The breeze made ripples through the wheat, which was starred over with cornflowers. Renard would cheerfully have followed his usual paths, the trenches or ditches which would have concealed him from the gaze of others, but he restrained himself a little as he relished the new pride of walking beside a powerful being, so sure of his own strength that he followed the straightest road and walked along the middle of it. "'You are leading us, Renard,' said the king. He drew himself up, frisking the tip of his tail, but he did not lose his sense of time nor the keenness of his glance. On the horizon, beyond the road, he could see a pointed spire that he recognised quickly. It was the village church, the church of Pastor Everard, father of Martin of Orleans. It was there, perhaps, that Outram Rufus, if his body had been fished out of the water, had heard his last solemn music. He felt bolder and bolder. He was separated from his enemy by King Noble's head, his brown mane, his teeth, his deep flanks, his paws that were thick rather than massive, all his royalty in action, and even Malpass itself could not have protected him better from his violence. His instinctive fox's cunning, which was more convincing than any words, warned him and calmed him. Noble despised the wolf for his blind clumsiness, his stupidity, and his dog-like smell. He also despised the fox, and Renard made no mistake about it, but without mingling with his disdain the repugnance that he barely disguised in the presence of Lord Eastgrim. On the contrary, indulgence and amusement could be read in his proud eyes when their glance alighted on his slender, lively companion. Then Renard saw other eyes, no less proud than those of the king, but much softer and warmer, and he would have sworn on his life that those eyes contained not an ounce of disdain. "'Where is this crazy fox leading us?' said the wolf. Straight to that village I can see down there. To that meadow, your majesty, said the fox. To that bull, cow and calf, who I swear are there for us. Like that peasant lying in the grass, the wolf went on, keeping watch over the horned beasts. Do they wear horns? asked Renard gravely, as though he intended no malice at all. Not the calf. He is too young and innocent. One has to reach your age first, Eastgrim. Noble smiled. The wolf growled and bared his teeth. Your Majesty, he said, listen to me and send this drollster on ahead. Let him show us the way and take care of this sleeping peasant for fear of dogs, weapons or traps. We will lie down on this little mound and wait for him to come back. And I'll keep my eye on him. Go on then, Renard, said King Noble, and show us what you can do. Renard dashed away, and now he could be himself again, creeping and hiding. He barely thought for a moment of running away to Malpass and hiding below ground. Apart from the fact that Eastgrim was watching him, there were a hundred good reasons to convince him that he should accept his mission and carry it out well, for in this way he could be even more certain of winning the king's favour. That alone would have decided him, for he was less skilful or more innocent than he thought. What did he know of the ways of the great? Although he was very much Renard the fox, he still had a little to learn. He ran round the back of the meadow, therefore, straining his eyes and ears, ready to flee at the first shout from a man, the first bark from a dog. At the same time he looked round, observing the gentle slope towards the river, the abrupt bank which had been cut sharply away by the water running through the rough, rich soil. He had placed himself to leeward of the peasant. Everything was in order. The high, stiff aftergrowth allowed him to go forward boldly, for the tips of the grass were barely ruffled by the light wind. From time to time he stopped, sniffed the air, measured the distance with his eye, and continued his approach. The man had lain down in the shade of a solitary tree, a very old wild pear tree with a twisted trunk, but covered in thick foliage and laden with fruit. Summertime pears, which hung down already ripe and surrounded with buzzing wasps. 
Renard reached the tree, stretched forward, and saw that the man was asleep, with his mouth open and his hat over his eyes. He thought out a plan of campaign, and put it into operation at once. First of all, he put out his claws like a cat, and climbed the tree. The rough bark and the knots in the twisted trunk helped him. Almost as lithe as Tibbet, he followed a big long branch, hiding the thick, shining leaves, just as the old cat would have done. Then he found himself looking down on the man. He almost emitted a slight bark of surprise and joy. That long face, those soft pale cheeks. He was not dreaming. It was Constant de Noir, the farmer who broke his word. Just let him wait a little, the lying scoundrel. Tonight, or tomorrow at the latest, they will know in the village whether the fine faithful Bronwyn will weep as much as Lady Ursa. Renard selected one of the ripest and heaviest pears. The skin was full of holes, and when he held it close to his ear, he could hear buzzing inside it. He plucked it, took aim at Constant's nose, and let it fall directly down onto it. Good shot! The pear broke open with a splash, and covered the man's nose and cheek. Constant raised his hand to it, and jumped to his feet, as though he had been burnt with a red-hot iron. The wasps were driven into a rage by the shock of the fall, and stung him hard. They clung to Constant, worried him, and stung him again. Renard, still lying on his branch, watched with eyes glowing like carbuncles, while the man rushed to the river bank, where he knelt down to wash himself and bathe his stinging face. But before he could do so, Renard came down the tree. He turned into a ram now. Everything was useful to him. He forgot nothing, rushed forward, pushed with his head against the farmer's skinny hindquarters and sent him, arms outflung before him, head first into the river. It was here that the water was deepest and the bank almost too steep for anyone to climb up, for the ground was crumbling and gradually falling away, making it impossible to take a firm grip. The farmer was already swallowing water and spitting it out. Renard followed him along the meadow, as soon as he saw a section of the bank which seemed to him to be loose underneath, he pushed it with his paw and jumped quickly back. The heavy clods of earth rolled down and collapsed, falling onto Constant de Noir and pushing his head down under the water. He came up once more, but finally sank down and disappeared, without knowing that death had come to him from this demon with the pointed nose, as red as a devil from hell, whom his half-drowned eyes thought they saw dancing along the river bank. But from the top of their mound... Eastgrim and the king could see him clearly. The wolf was still peevish. "'Your Majesty,' he said, "'in whom are you placing your trust? "'He is both crazy and criminal. "'He will invent some trick with men, bulls or dogs, "'and he would even betray us. "'Look at him, dancing down the meadow along the water's edge. "'He's not thinking about us any more. "'If death comes for you one day, and you have to send her a message. Send Renard. Like that, you will never die. I will remember what you say, said the king, but if he has lied to me, I will make him regret it. Let us go. They went into the meadow, straight to the tree. Renard came to meet them. Others would have been pleased with themselves for less. He came up to them and told the king about Constant's death showing him the water which was still foaming. "'It's not true,' growled the wolf. "'He's crazy, criminal, and a liar too.' "'In that case, your majesty,' murmured Renard, "'let one of you, Eastgrim, I mean, "'dive into these long water weeds, "'and he'll see our man entangled among them. "'He was in the meadow. "'He is no longer there, for I have drowned him. "'Now the bull is ours.' the cow too, and the calf with them. Ours, did you say? growled the wolf again. Your Majesty! I am saying nothing, remarked the lion quietly. The ball will be yours, said the wolf. Naturally, Lady Proud will have this tender heifer who is in her prime. The calf will be mine, and I'll content myself with that. King Noble said no more. He stretched out his enormous paw. His four claws drew blood from Eastgrim's head, tearing his cheek and the skin above it. Share them out, Renard, 
said King Noble. This wretch does not understand. Everything is yours, your majesty, cried Renard. He was trembling, his tail was hanging low and close against him. Blood was running down Eastgrim's muzzle in a red stream. I said share them, the lion went on. I am king. I intend, therefore, to be fair and respect the rights of each one of us. Your majesty, said Renard in a trembling voice, may it please you to accept this magnificent strong fat bull. This cow, who is still no more than a heifer, is indeed tender and worthy of Lady Proud, if your grace should consent to it, and let this milk calf be offered to the amiable lion cub, your son, who is just weaned or about to be so. Let his young claws and princely teeth receive it. As for this lout and myself, we are worthless. We will tighten our belts a little until a better opportunity comes along. Justum est, said King Noble. Renard, turning into a dog now, ran round the meadow in a big circle, barking as he brought the three animals to the lion. They had seen the great carnivore. Even the bull, rolling his eyes in terror and fury, obeyed the shrill voice and ran towards the royal claws. Well done, Renard, said Noble finally. You have behaved very well and you please me, Renard. But tell me, where does all this wisdom come from? So much of it in such a tiny head. From the wolf, said the fox, and the handsome red cap that your royal paw has just placed on his head. The lion yawned, half closing his eyes, and laughed long and silently, and suddenly, sniffing his prey, he swished his tail against his flanks, tossed his mane back, and, trotting gently, set out to Breviand, driving the bull, the cow, and the calf before him.